I think I am actually ready, so I'll, I'll talk for a while. We'll see what happens. Um, Intel what? Intel I'm an Intel employee. I'm using the Intel font. <laughs> I knew you were going to comment on my font choice regardless, so I thought that <laughs> I thought the comment might as well point to Intel rather than something else. Um, like, what kind of idiot font did you choose, Carl? But this way I can at least blame my corporate overlords for choosing the font. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm uh, working for Intel, as Keith just mentioned, and I'm using the Intel font. Um, I, I'm talking today about a little project I've done the past few weeks called Glaze. It's not anything very big and exciting, but it's what I did the last few weeks, so I thought I'd talk about it. Um, Let's go through about this. So this is a, a Glaze is a, a tool for wrapping, uh, for helping users that want to wrap the OpenGL uh, interface. And the first question is, you know, why would you ever want to wrap the OpenGL interface? Well, it turns out um, you can do some interesting things. You could measure how fast your application is rendering things. You could uh, capture all of the OpenGL calls into a trace file and replay it. That's what API Trace does. There's lots of Lots of um, lots of tools and utilities wrap the OpenGL API in various ways, and this is a list of of several that do it. And um, um, so the, I started. Um, is it Jose or Jose Fonseca? I don't even know how to pronounce it. You said Jose earlier. Jose. Okay. Jose Fonseca started the API Trace project in 2008. Um, I started it, hacking on it a couple of years ago, um, and let me. Since then, I, I, I've worked on another pr little program called FIPS, and most recently Glaze. So let me go through um, these. And so API Trace is um, a tool that allows you to, it interposes itself between the application and the OpenGL um, uh, implementation, and captures all of the data that goes across the OpenGL API. So every function call, all of the image data, everything that goes by, and it puts that into a trace file. Later, it can replay that trace file and, and do some various th things to it. So um, uh, this has been, I, I hope, we, it's already been, API Trace has been mentioned a couple times throughout the day. I hope most people are familiar with it. It's, a, it's incredibly useful. We really uh, have had a lot of uh, advantage by using it as a bug capture and replication tool. Rather than saying, you know, here, here I ran this application and I encountered this bug, you can say, here's this trace file. If you replay it, you will see the bug. It's a much, much more useful bug report. And it's very common now that we, on, on our bug tracker, just say, okay, you reported a bug, now send me the trace file. Um, so as far as how the wrapping Im, Im, uh, is implemented in API Trace, it can use an LD preload mechanism, which I'll talk about uh, more later. And it can also um, provide an entire uh, libgl.so that implements the, the whole lib, um, OpenGL API. And th that can be uh, hooked in via LD library path. So it has, it has two mechanisms. Um, we started trying to use, we, we've done some um, work with API Trace to do performance measurement. We added some code to um, do some CPU and GPU uh, timing um, collection on every call while replaying. And as we started looking at um, using API Trace for performance measurement, we found that um, when I say we, I'm talking about the, the team at Intel doing uh, driver development. And so sometimes API Trace is perfect for what we want to do for performance measurement because by the time you're replaying an, an API Trace, the application logic is completely non-existent. The application doesn't exist anymore. You just have what the application did as an artifact. And so that's nice in the fact that we won't be measuring the application. We can focus more on just what's happening in, in the driver. Uh, on the flip side, sometimes improving the application is actually what you care about. You have a customer request that says this application isn't behaving correctly. Some of that might be in the driver uh, in the implementation of OpenGL. Some of it could be something else, CPU side, could be a part of, um, it could be some strange cache interactions between the application and the OpenGL implementation, such that by the time we are doing a replay, we don't see the same interactions. Um, another difficulty with API Trace for performance measurement is that it has quite a large overhead if you have a you know, gigabyte plus trace file that it's uh, loading into memory and decompressing. 
that CPU overhead can often become uh, significant and interfere with our, our tracing. So from there, I said, well, if we want to do live um, performance measurement of uh, an application, why don't we just do that? And I started writing this program called FIPS that initially used um, LD preload to, um, to insert itself between the application and uh, the OpenGL API. And I thought, you know, how, how hard can this be? Um, well, it turns out it's really hard. But so uh, let's, I'll go through that in a little bit. Mm. Yeah, there was, there were, I guess I'll, I'll just mention, there were, I, I had the initial version working, and then I tried it with a particular application and found it didn't work and fixed it to work with that application, and I repeated this several times. Well, um, out of the blue, uh, Alexander Monikov uh, contacted me and said, hey, I've been watching, this is just, I just love how open source development works. I didn't even know anyone knew about the, this project. I was just posting it to my own little Git repository. And um, Alexander contacts me and says, hey, I've watched how much you've been thrashing around trying to get um, FIPS to work with a wide variety of applications. And he says, it pains me because I went through all of that pain myself and I've seen other people go through it. What we really need is to document in one place how you should wrap OpenGL and, and do it correctly. And so he did that. He wrote this document, which I've, I've got the URL uh, for there. And I said, wow, Alexander, that's a great document. You should come to XDC and give a talk about it. And he decided not to come. So he said, why don't you talk about it instead? So really, this is Alexander's talk. Um, and uh, he gets all the credit for any of the good ideas. And all the bad ideas are my implement implementation mistakes. So I tried to implement some, a lot of the ideas he has in that blog post. And, um, and that's where, where Glaze came from. OK. so. Now we're going to go through a little bit of code history, um, and we'll see how, how, how well my demos work here. We're, we're going to imagine uh, an application developer wants to wrap OpenGL. Uh, let's say I want to do the simplest thing, which is to measure frames per second uh, uh, for, the, for this application. So um, this should be pretty easy. So here is my uh, first attempt. Uh, no, this is my last attempt. All out of order. GLFPS. Okay, so I've got this GLFPS um, program here. And what I've done, this is the entire program, it fits on two screens here. I've Im implemented GLX swap buffers, um, and um, I'm intending this to work via LD preload. So I, I've written my own uh, substitute version of a library function, that GLX swap buffers that exist in the o OpenGL library. and. What I say is every time this thing's called, um, I'm going to call my on each frame method up here. And I'm going to do some simple timing from uh, every 60 frames. Oops. Introduce some bugs while I'm here. Yeah, every 60 frames, ca count how much elapsed time has elapsed, and compute a frames per second from that, print it out. Very simple. OK. Meanwhile, the only other thing that goes on here is I um, use um, uh, I, make, I make a DL sim function call with the magic RTLD next um, macro saying, I want you to look up later in the loader chain of this chain of ch the sequence of libraries that the dynamic uh, linker has loaded up. I want you to find some other implementation of this GLX swap buffers. And after I've done my work, I want to call that real, real function. Okay? Pretty simple. Let's see if we can. Oh, we'll see my fonts. I didn't plan this part of the demo. I need a bigger. F no, I, I did. I'm supposed to use a different terminal. Let's see. Here we go. So, um, in order to run this, I'm going to say ld preload. And so I just compiled this lib glfps library, glfps.so. So what I'm instructing the dynamic loader here is says when I run GLX gears, I'm running it in this environment where before you load any of the actual libraries that GLX gear uses, I want you to load this one first. And so it'll get first dibs on grabbing any symbols. And we can actually look at the what the loader does here. If I say LED GLX gears, nope, I can't. But I can say which GLX gears. There's a lot of output. So libgl is coming from tilde seaworth opt mesa lib, where I've compiled and installed mesa. But if I do the ld preload, 
Uh, this isn't actually what I'm, I'm getting a little off. No, nothing's going to change here. This is for later. Um, but anyway, so if I, if I do this LD preload and I run GLX gears, then my thing should hopefully get loaded and we'll see something happen. And it couldn't. Ignored. Look at that. Well, if I spelled it right, it might work. <laughs> Thank you. And still not finding it. This is the beauty of live demos. They're so fun. Try that. Woo! All right. Um, OK, so now my thing is running, and every 60 frames, it's reporting, it, reporting its FPS, which gives us almost zero value because GLX Gears is reporting that itself. OK, but it worked. <laughs> so next, um, when might not this program work? Any guesses? Somebody else uses LD preload. Oh, someone else uses LD preload. That can get real fun. We'll, we're going to postpone that one. Oh, what if the application DL opens libgl? Well, if it uh, if DL opens libgl itself, rather than just being directly linked against it, then my LD preload has no effect. It's going to reach directly into the uh, DL opened um, thing and pull out its own DL sims. And my LD preload does if not get involved. DL if it DL sims GLX swap buffers, right. it's going to get GLX swap buffers out of that thing that it just loaded. Uh, we also have um, in OpenGL this GLX get proc address uh, mechanism where it's a very similar kind of thing allows the application to effectively reach around my LD preload. So I can do version number two and go and uh, what have I changed here? I, in this version, I'm dealing with the um, get proc address. So I have added now uh, my own wrapped implementation of GLX get proc address. And I do the same thing. So now, when the application calls GLX get proc address, I look at it and I say, oh, well, if they're trying to do a get proc address of GLX swap buffers, I want to return mine. Um, otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and uh, look up with the DL sim the, the real GLX get proc address and defer down to that. And of course, we have GLX get proc address comes in two flavors with the ARB uh, suffix or not. And uh, so, okay, so my program got like twice as long, but it should still work. And it's not even very interesting to show that. So I think what I will show instead, um, one of the things I had done while writing FIPS was I, as I started encountering a lot of these applications that link to OpenGL different ways, um, and did it, I just wrote a little test suite a uh, little suite of programs that talk to OpenGL as many ways as I could think of. And if I run this here, we can see, yes, now the, um, if I have a program that links directly to libgl and calls it directly, that passes. If it links to libgl but uses glx get proc address or get proc address arb, those pass. But the ones that, like you mentioned, use dl open are still failing. So then we have to go to version two version 02, version, the third version of my program. All right, so now, um, now I have to wrap DLSIM. Well, wrapping DLSIM <laughs> is a pain. Be is this the Absolutely. <laughs> Except that you have, this, you have this problem when you wrap DLSIM. I showed you wrapping two functions earlier. And as part of wrapping them, I have to call DLSIM to get to the real underlying function. But now I want to wrap DLSIM itself. Uh, this gets kind of s tricky. Um, here's one solution that is kind of ugly that but happens to be, um, oh, I, I'm deferring here to do real DLSIM. What does that do? Do real, do real DLSIM. Can't call DLSIM itself because that would just you know, infinitely recurse, and that wouldn't be very much fun for any of us. So in th we can, if we happen to be on a glibc system, we can get really chummy with the implementation, and we can know there's a, a symbol in there called underscore underscore libc underscore dlsim, and we can call that one ourselves, and we can pass it the name dlsim, and then we can get the original dlsim back out. Because the underscore underscore one doesn't actually do everything we want. It doesn't implement the RTLD next and some of the other things. So this is really ugly. Um, but this is the kind of thing you have to do if you want to get things to work. So, uh, and this isn't, I came up with a totally different, similarly ugly, cleaner, uglier, I don't know, a different version in FIPS, but this is the one I'm showing today. 
So let's see if that works. Zero to make. And we test it. Hooray! It all passes. But it's starting to get really ugly. We had, we had to do these ugly hacks and getting chummy and go research, go digging through the source of glibc to find if this works. And we're less portable now and, and these things. And we, don't have the, we still have the problem that Keith mentioned. Well, what if, another pro, what if the program we're trying to run is also using LD preload? Well, you can, it's easy to get into situations depending on how exactly I implemented my LD preload and how exactly that application implemented its LD preload, whether we stack up nicely or not. I showed you in my DL sims, I was calling R RTLD next. RTLD next is a nice a mechanism such that you can stack LD preloads and they will chain one to the next because each one asks for symbols. That's what the next thing, you get symbols <laughs> from the next one and it in turn can chain along. But not every um, program is written that way. Um, and we've even found programs that fail to work with LD preload based wrappers altogether. Um, Unigen, some of the Unigen benchmarks, uh, tropics and heaven behave differently and they've caused problems with different applications. I have not been able to figure out exactly what they did. Jose had some theories and Alexander Monikov had some different theories. I tried, I, I verified that I've, my LD preload based wrappers fail on some of these programs. Um, and um, so what Jose did, for example, in API trace, he says, oh, if you run into one of these programs, stop using pre LD preload. And instead, we have this other um, libgl.so library that gets spit out by API trace. Add that to your LD library path, and we won't use LD preload at all. And um, so I tried to write in this little test suite here uh, an application that fails in exactly the same way as the unit ben benchmarks. And it didn't, su didn't succeed. Every time I tried to implement the theories that Jose and Alexander had, had posited on what exactly Unigen was doing, my program's passed. So I have a known program that fails, and I'm not sure why. But we have we know that if we don't use LD preload and we use L L LD library path, we can we can get past it. Well, that's a pain. What's what's a pain about getting rid of LD? What, what's nice about LD preload is that when I wanted to override one or two or four or fifteen functions, I implemented one or two or four or fifteen functions. If I want to instead provide an alternate libgl.so that the application can either link directly against or DL open or however it's going to link against it, I now need to implement every single function in the OpenGL ABI. And that's a pain because there's a lot of them. And if I did very simple stubs that accepted all the arguments and then passed them on again, I would need, I'd need all the functions, each with their own signatures and, and do that all correctly. And all of that work is actually already done in API trace within its um, C++ code base and all that. And, and it's working. But um, I don't know. I'm like, I don't want to break down and do that. But I have these programs that I can't get my wrapper to work on. Well, Alexander saved the day for me. He introduced me to something I wasn't um, familiar with at all. Oh, look at that. My, um, getting, so let me jump ahead. He introduced me to a mechanism known as iFunk. And this is a really slick thing that um, is implemented in our um, dynamic linker and has really nice support in GCC. It's been there for quite a long time, actually. So this is how it looks with the GCC support. And uh, this is how you would code up an iFunk. So let, what's going on here? I have, I'm trying to implement a function foo, OK? Um, I don't implement any function named foo. I instead just provide a declaration for foo. And I say if foo, I give it this magic attribute, here's the GCC support. Foo is actually just an iFunk. And to figure out what the real function foo is that you should, you should call, you should call in, um, this foo resolver function. Okay, this mechanism was originally uh, implemented for doing things like when people wanted to have um, two different implementations of memcopy and uh, one used particular SSE instructions or, you know, some are, there's, there's multiple versions and they're architecture specific. So at runtime, they wanted to do some identification of what processor was, was being used and substitute some processor specific uh, implementation of this function. And so iFunk is the mechanism that does this. So what happens is when we have an iFunk in our library, at the first time, well, whenever the loader decides it's time to resolve this function, usually at, at the time of first call, it instead will call this resolver function. 
the resolver function then will actually return a function pointer. So here's my foo resolver function. I can do some, some testing and say if, if some condition do return some function pointer, otherwise return some other function pointer. And here's where the real magic happens. At this point, the dynamic loader takes that return value and actually rewrites the PLTs and shoves the return function call into place, such, such that the next time the foo function gets called, the resolver is not called at all, and it's called directly um, and efficiently to the, the, fu the function I resolve to. Well, that's cool, because uh, I get really uh, efficient dispatch. I, I got to make this decision once, and then from then on, I say, oh, this is a function that's implemented by my wrapper, call the wrapper, or this function is not implemented by my wrapper, call directly into um, libgl. And from then on, I never need to make the decision again. So that's cool. But the second thing that's really cool about the ifunc is right here. My resolver is uh, a function that accepts no arguments. So I don't need to capture all of the various arguments of um, all of the different functions in the OpenGL API. Instead, I can implement an ifunc resolver for every one because they're all just, um, all the resolvers have the same signature. Well, I have to enumerate them all, but that's it. I don't need to capture the signatures. It's a big, it's a big win. Okay, you don't think so. Well, I'll show you what I did. Um, what's that? Yeah, I mean, it's not just listing the signatures. You'd have to capture all the arguments. You'd have to re you'd repeat them in the function. You'd have to have local variables that capture them, pass them on. It would be a pain. So here's what it looks like. Yeah, you could, you could, you could probably do some things. Here's, here's what, so here's what I have. I'll show you. I like it. No. I don't know. No, no, we have a huge pile of code for doing that kind of thing. That's how we generate the, the GL dispatch tables in, lib, in libgl, and it's awful. Yeah, it's <laughs> it is a huge pile of work. Th this thing, this thing is a pony and a rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's missing the rainbow. <laughs> More comments? Go. So, so the unfortunate feature of iFunks is that, as far as I know, you can't change the resolver result later. Um, yeah. So that, that's a problem for trying to use it to replace GL dispatch tables, unfortunately. Yeah, and so since the dynamic leaker it has all this magic, it has the so ability at runtime to accept a return value and then rewrite the PLTs. It would be nice if we could extend the loader so that we could get access to that in other ways other than a one-shot iFunk. So if someone wants to go in and play with the dynamic linker and give us that ability, that would be really cool because then we could do these kinds of things inside um, Mesa, where we need to be able to change the, the dispatch tables on the fly. For my, for my purposes, for my wrappers are pretty static in that they, impl they the goal I have is to implement a subset of the OpenGL API, and that's it. So uh, a one-shot one iFunk is fine. So here's this little macro I have in, in Glaze. Uh, this is a macro that implements exactly the same code you saw on the last slide. I declare um, a function with an iFunk attribute, and then I implement a resolver function and um, I had a conditional on the last one. I said, if this, return that. But this one just returns one resolve function. And that same resolve function is used, it's uh, somewhere around here. Um, it's used by all, um, by all, all of the iPhones. There's nothing, there's nothing function specific about it. It just says, look in the, the wrapper library. If it's there, return it. If it's not, return the other one. Uh, also has this, this little, thing at the beginning with this uh, first GL call. That's just a little convenience thing I might mention later if we, if we come around to it. So anyway, but so, uh, once I define this macro, I can include these little specs files. So if you look at specs, gl.def, there it is. It's an enumeration of all of the functions that exist in, in um, OpenGL. And this comes from the um, XML files. So it's as very, as every bit as good as these are, which I hope they're complete. I just downloaded them from chronos.org. And it, um, it's just processed with this little one-liner script that just pulls out the, um, the function names. So that was, I thought that was really slick. We could have just this simple list of function names with no signatures. And from that, I can generate a library that has an ifunc for every um, function in the OpenGL um, ABI. So now I have, uh, I, from this I can generate, from basically just what I've shown you, I can implement a libgl that an application can link against and run and it doesn't do anything <laughs> other than passing stuff off to uh, OpenGL. But it had, I had the ability to make that decision and so I can, um, 
insert my other uh, wrapper in, in place. So now, <laughs> go back to my talk. Where was I? Version 3. What am I doing now? So now I, I, I took all that code um, that was implementing GLX get proc address, all the code that was doing DLSIM. I, was, I threw all that away. Um, I instead added an include of glaze.h. Um, and there's a little convenience function here, a convenience macro that glaze provides. It's glaze defer um, that is going to defer to the real underlying GLX swap buffers with these function arguments. So that, that macro is doing just what you saw before of uh, declaring a, a local variable to hold the real function pointer, doing the lookup uh, at first call and going on. Um, so at this point, th my program, uh, my wrapping program looks as simple as the very first one I did with the LD preload. Um, but now it's a lot more robust. It can work with applications that do DL open, with applications that use GLX get proc address. And um, let's see if it works. So GLF and PS3, compile it, and run it. Well, that's boring. It looks just like it did before. <laughs> All right. So. Um, yeah, so it did work. There, there are some differences in how to actually run this thing. So I was h hiding the running of it inside that, um, inside the test suite program. So let me show you actually how it, we run this. So let's go back to the previous version, FPS02. And what we, we, we did this before. We said LD preload. So I did show that one. Yeah. So okay, we can th we can run it with LD preload. The new one that's using Glaze, we don't run with LD preload anymore. We have to instead, and this is going to look a lot uh, less convenient. It's, it's kind of a pain. I'll probably get it wrong three times if I try to type it manually here. Um, but what we have to do is first we have to, instead of LD preload, we tell Glaze through an environment variable where our wrapper is. So that's no harder. But now we actually have to get GLX gears to link against the gl the Glaze library. That whole um, library full of all the um, those, those ifunks. So I'm going to uh, modify LD library path and I'm going to put it on so um, I, can't, I can't type and talk at the same time. Sorry about that. I'm not that com competent. Oh, here's one other uh, fancy thing that um, Alexander taught me that I didn't know before. See, I told you all the good ideas are from Alexander. So home Seaworth opt glaze, that's the prefix that I installed glaze to. And then under lib, let's take a look there. As you might expect, you will see um, the lib glaze library. Lib glaze is the library that just provides some of the convenience functions that glaze has. But underneath there, and the reason it's not uh, the reason it's hiding away in a glaze library is because we don't want to have um, this library uh, full of ifunks on our LD library path as under, uh, under normal use, because otherwise you're gonna. It, it's when you only want to have get you only want to get at it when you're actually running a wrapper, a glaze wrapper. So we hide away um, the ifunk library, and it's under glaze. And then there's this extra lib directory. And under the lib, there's this extra x86-64. It looks like I've got these gratuitous two levels of directory that I'm hiding it under there. But the reason I did that, and this was really fun, is that instead of specifying those directly, the dynamic linker lets you say $lib. Put that on there. And um, when you do that, it knows how to, the, li the linker knows what architecture you're on and knows how to expand $lib to uh, either, you know, in this case, i386 Linux GNU, lib slash i386 Linux GNU, or lib slash x86-64. So, so Glaze automatically compiles a 32-bit and a 64-bit version and installs both. And that ends up being really convenient because a lot of the games and things that we like to use for testing 
um, are compiled for 32-bit, even though we're running 64-bit operating, operating systems. So I put the Glaze library on my path. I put the uh, Glaze wrapper on my path. Um, I'm still not there yet. Glaze also needs to know how to find the real underlying libgl. It can't look on the LD library path anymore because it's going to find itself. So we have to tell it, and that's annoying. This is like a pain to use. And so we say glaze libgl, and where is it? Seaworth opt mesa lib libgl.so. Is that going to work? Is there any way that's going to work? Oh, it worked. Wow. OK. So but that's all a pain. I thought, well, I didn't really win. I wanted this to be just as easy to use as LD Preload, and clearly that's not. <laughs> so I did two things. One is I wrote a little helper program called Glaze. And Glaze knows itself where its library is installed, so we don't need that anymore. And get rid of that whole thing. Then Glaze is going to accept as um, an argument where the wrapper is. So we, do, we can get rid of that one. This last bit of, well, I'll just show this first. Mm -hmm. I typed that wrong. Glaze lib, GL, yes. Glaze wrapper, and we tell it to run GLX gears. Still working. Okay, still working. Good. So we got rid of one of the annoying things, is now we have a little helper program that knows where the library lives. But it's still annoying to have the, um, to have to specify where libgl is. So the, um, so I just decided to get rid of that. I don't need that. Okay, so, so Glaze figures that out too. And what it does to do that is before running the program you tell it to run, in this case GLX gears, it just has a tiny little program that directly links against libgl and it uh, runs that and, and figures out, and it, and it prints out where the libgl it linked against. In fact, Glaze has on my system two versions, one for 32-bit and one for 64-bit. It runs both of them and holds on to the both values, passes them through environment variables, because it doesn't know until the program runs GLX gears what kind of, uh, what architecture is going to run. So it's, it runs its two little test programs, puts the resulting uh, variables into, values into environment variables, then GLX gears runs with the altered, uh, it sets up an altered LD library path so that its own library gets loaded. That library can then tell, oh, look, I'm 64-bit, and it knows where to do it. Anyway, the details aren't that interesting. Um, the, the important part is that we now can um, run a wrapped program very nearly as conveniently as using LD preload. Um, similarly, um, I do I have a way of demonstrating it? Um, and it, you don't have to use the Glaze program to get at this. There's also a Glaze execute function within the convenience library that does all of that same magic. So if you write your own test program for your wrapper, um, it can get at uh, all the same convenience and all it has to do is pass the file name of the .so to Glaze and it will do all the rest. Any questions on any of that so far? Let's go back to my slides. Okay, so the goal then is that Glaze um, give us, gives us all the additional robustness um, without the user having to do any more than if they're using LD Preload. They write the subset of things. They, it works across lots of different applications. They don't, the wrapper author doesn't have to do the get proc address and DL sim nonsense. Oh, and as of this morning, uh, wrappers can nest nicely too. So LD Preload lets you do a colon separated list of um, uh, of libraries that each get preloaded in turn and you can use the RTLD next. Getting wrapping to work nicely in Glaze was a little bit trickier. Um, I won't bother anyone with the gory details. Just, we'll just know that you can do it. You, so I could, for example, um, let's see, I have, oh yeah, so here's, an here, here's something I did. GL, I didn't show the most convenient version. GLFPS, GLX gears. There's the most convenient version. And so you can obviously write a little test program that gets at all the convenience. In this case, that little test program was simply a, a, a shell script that runs Glaze and um, does like before. So I have a second test program over here. It's called Glenn. This is another example of why you might want to do some wrapping. Um, Ian 
wanted to capture some um, API traces on one uh, OpenGL system and then replay them on another. But the two uh, OpenGL implementations have differing sets of extensions and things provided. So um, in order to be successfully replay, we need to make sure that the application only sees the common um, extension list. So what would be nice is if we had a way at, when running the capture tool to say, oh, I want you to ignore what the extension list is, this implementation says, and use this extension list instead. So that's this, um, this GLM program, which I wrote, lets you do that, and it's implemented using Glaze. And so GLM lets us change these aspects of the um, GL environment, the vendor, the renderer, the version, chain language version, and the extension list via either an explicit list or a whitelist or a blacklist. So for example, if I say GL um, and version equals, look at this, it's so easy to implement version 4.0 of OpenGL. Um, <laughs> renderer equals Carl, um, and we'll just run GLX info, dash V, I don't know. We won't even see Carl, but we'll see the version. Hey, look at that, OpenGL version string 4.0. Okay, so, um, so there's a little simple program that lets us do that, and what I wanted to hopefully show is that I can run that, and I can tell it to run GLFPS, <laughs> and it can then run GLX gears, we'll say, and hopefully it'll all work. And, well, okay, I didn't have anything to print the fact that the environment was modified. GLX gears didn't behave any differently on OpenGL 4.0. But you, you can just trust me, it did. If you look closely at the output, you'll see there's this seg fault and error and stuff like that, um, the, which looks kind of ugly. But that was actually perfectly fine and expected. Um, that's the little, t those little test programs I showed you that, gla that I told you about that Glaze runs to test where the libgl is. It runs one that's 32-bit and one that's 64-bit. And once I've chained two of these things, I end up specifying a, a, a 64-bit preload with the 32-bit application, and it gets very confused. Doesn't actually cause us any problems, so I just need to redirect those those uh, messages away to DevNull. And um, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll wrap that. That'll be good. That'll be fun. No. Um, so we have. Like I said, uh, we, ha we automatically take the, from the Chronos XML files all the symbols. We have c all the convenience there to make this pretty easy for the application from the uh, author's point of view. Uh, I've showed this already. That's the painful way to use Glaze. The easier way is to use the little command line program. And uh, th here's the three different ways that you can do nesting with Glaze. Uh, you can specify multiple. Uh, Dot .so files in the Glaze wrapper environment variable. You could call Glaze the program itself multiple times, or you could call the, the various programs if they, you know, were using Glaze execute themselves. I think that might be all I have to say. Any questions about that? In. Can you use it to wrap functions through git proc address that maybe it hasn't heard of? So if you wanted to, you know, my, my, my joke is always that GL get proc address never returns null if you call, you know, GL get proc address on GL ham sandwich. It will give you a, p a function pointer. Can, mm -hmm. can you make a wrapper that does that, or do you need to go in and, and tweak Glaze so that it knows about ham sandwich? So right now, you, you can do that. Um, uh, the implementation of get proc address within um, Glaze will look to see if your library also implemented its own GL Get proc, get proc address, and if so, we'll <laughs> defer to it, which can then defer back down to the real one. <laughs> so I, I anticipated the, the, to let you do that. I haven't actually tested whether there's not infinite recursion okay, there. Okay, that's somewhere. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but that should work. I saw on Alex's page that uh, he mentioned um, ELF filtering, and uh, I've played around with that a little bit for some other things for the uh, OpenGL ABI uh, effort. Um, did you experiment with that at all? I haven't. He has, he has some great ideas about how some of the problems that you run into and that I've described here could be solved um, with some um, simple mechanisms within, uh, you know, the dynamic loader itself. One, I think he's, he's had some good success with filtering. It's just slower than he'd like it to be, um, and he's 
submitted some patches to improve the performance there that have not been accepted upstream yet. Was that was that for filtering or uh, LD audit? Uh, it could have been it could have been the LD yeah, audit. So yeah. I might be mixing that up. Um, so no, I haven't looked at that. But yeah. he had some other ideas for if people are interested in these kinds of areas. There were some other things he said. Oh, if someone would just implement this in the linker, it'd be nice. Yeah. Oh, meanwhile, if you do play with iFunks, I noticed uh, myself by you know, doing the very natural thing the, uh, when I first wrote my very first iPhone, because I put a little printf in there to make sure it was working, and uh, I ran GLX gears, and I had all of a sudden these vertices and polygons that were all over the place, and I'm like, what is going on? Well, it turns out that the um, iFunk implementation in the loader is really broken. It doesn't actually save uh, the floating point registers that it goes on that you may end up clobbering. It, it tends to, most of the dynamic loaders are very careful. They have this style of, we're not going to save those registers, and then we'll never touch them, and it, everything will be OK, honest. <laughs> Except that uh, with iFunk, obviously, they're calling out to my resolver function, which is calling uh, string functions that do use the floating point registers. And so the floating point uh, arguments being passed to my GL calls, on the first call, the one that triggered the resolution, the parameters got clobbered. Well, fortunately uh, for me, I was using GLX gears, which uses a display list and captures those parameters on the first call. So instead of only the first frame being broken, all subsequent frames were broken, and I actually got to see the bug. Um, I've reported this bug upstream, and they said, oh, yep, yeah, that's clearly a bug. We should start saving those registers. And uh, they haven't implemented that yet. So um, so for now, if you're use, imp, using iFunks, be very careful not to touch any floating point registers, or you may things may go bad. Anything else? How do I do in using up my time? Mm, I'm not I should have talked a little longer, but oh well. All right, thank you.